everyone. Thank you for taking time to tune in our talk short session today. Uh, my name is Jia Xuan. I am from the Outreach and Education Unit of the Lee Kong Chen Natural History Museum. And today we are very happy to have with us Dr. Amy Chung, Senior Lecturer at the Department of Biological Sciences at the National University of Singapore. So Dr. Chung will speak to us about a group of often overlooked but omnipresent uh, organisms that are also the silent guardians of our nature. And that is none other than the kingdom of fungi. Uh, if you have always been curious about fungi and you are not sure where to start learning about them, today will be a very good introduction to what a fungi is and why we should start caring about these organisms. But before we start, just um, some gentle reminders for everyone. So the session will be recorded uh, today and it will be uploaded to our museum's uh, website's resource tab in due time. And the session duration is approximately about 45 minutes long, including the Q&A segment. But depending on the number of questions we get, the session might be slightly longer than 45 minutes, but it should not exceed one hour. And throughout the session, you may actually submit your questions via the Q&A icon that you should find at the bottom of your Zoom panel. You may also view questions submitted by other participants and upvote um, questions that you find interesting and would like to know the answer for. Yep, so Dr. Chu will be speaking for about 30 to 40 minutes and any questions um, submitted will only be answered after she finishes um, talking. And if you would like to ask your questions verbally during the Q&A segment instead, you may use the raise hands function, um, which you can find the button at the reactions button at the bottom of your Zoom panel. And I will assist to call out your name for you to ask your questions verbally. So next. Um, we would highly encourage you to stay till the end of the session today and fill out our feedback form. A QR code will be flashed after the Q&A segment and you can suggest topics uh, you would like us to cover for our future talks. If you would like to enter our giveaway uh, to win a set of exclusive uh, LKCNHM Terrestrial Biodiversity of Singapore postcards, then please enter your email address in the feedback form later. So at entering your email address um, is optional for filling up the feedback form, but compulsory for the giveaway because the winners will be contacted via email. So we will be giving out three sets of the postcards uh, for today's session. So with that, I will stop sharing my slides and I will let Dr. Chung take over and I hope everyone enjoys today's session. Yeah, Dr. Chung, please. Okay. Hello, good, good evening, everyone. Thank you for taking time out to attend this talk. Okay. Uh, so the title is The Kingdom Fungi, and then it's diverse and powerful. Okay, so why are they... Uh, so this is the outline of my talk. Um, and then uh, I will go through them one by one. And then here goes. Okay, so what are fungi? Um, fungi are, okay, hang on, uh, let me remove all these things first. Okay, so fungi, first thing is they are not plants, so they cannot photosynthesize, okay? And then they have, you know, the, the cells, right? The cells have walls, okay, very similar to plant. Instead of cellulose, they have chitin. Um, chitin are those substances that make up seafood, like you know, lobster, like insects, like moths. So that's the exoskeleton, the outer skeleton part of um, insects, and they are made of chitin. And then when you hear the term fungi, basically you are referring to mushroom, toadstools, moles, and many other things that you might not have seen before because a lot of the fungi are actually extremely small. Now, let me start with, oops, let me start with um, how they reproduce. Why are there so many fungi, which you may not have seen? So let's start with penicillium. Um, penicillium is a fungus. Uh, it's microscopic. So you can see from this slide here, um, the, 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 can you see my mouse? Huh? Can you see my mouse? So the mouse here is, showing the part where they have the spores and all that okay now let me share uh let me share another uh video 
finish not share and then I do a new share. Penicillium. Penicillium is a multicellular branched filamentous fungus and it produces asexually by the formation of non motile spores called conidia. During asexual reproduction, erect branches called conidiophores are produced from a fungal hyphae. At their tip, conidiophores branch and form clusters of flask shaped cells called sterigmata. Conidia are produced in chains from the tips of steric matter by mitosis and are almost green in color. Conidia, thus formed, are then dispersed into the air. And when they fall on suitable substratum, produce new fungal hyphae. So, just now you saw how the fungus uh, reproduce. That's the asexual form of reproduction. Okay, so that's the asexual form. And then you might see if you ever do culture work like, um, you know, growing tissue culture, doing, uh, trying to grow plants using tissue culture, or you are doing uh, fungal culture, the contaminants are very often all these penicillium. So you saw in the video also, they produce a lot of spores called conidia, and then these will just go into the air, and then they will contaminate, and then they will grow a lot. So they are very, very common in the air. We are actually breeding a lot of these all the time. Now, the next video I'm going to show you, uh, this one is uh, what we call mushroom now. Now, mushroom would be those that we are familiar with. Okay, can you see this video? Okay, so you can see these are very normal looking mushrooms, right? Uh, and then those white stuff that are coming out, those are the spores being released by the two mushroom bodies. So basically, the mushrooms drop down. And then the air current, which actually they produce, uh, cause this heat and all that. Uh, then they'll go into the airstream and then they'll fly off. Okay. So uh, there are two different ways of reproduction. So the first video I showed you is asexual reproduction. Now, mushrooms that we are familiar with are all the products of sexual reproduction. So that's how they reproduce, okay? So that's how uh, we have so many kinds of mushrooms and fungi. Okay, next. So this is a microscope view of one example of spores, right? And you can see down there at the bottom uh, right is a scale bar, which is the, the whole bar is 20 microns. So 1,000 micron is 1 mm. Uh. So you can see, obviously, that these spores are less than 1 mm. So they are very small. So that's why they, they, they are discharged in the video. They look like clouds of you know, very, very tiny things. Now, if you were to have the experience or if you want to do your own uh, small collection, right, you can actually get one of the, the mushroom growing around by the roadside. For instance, you cut off the stalk and then you put the cap. You know, so this view here, the cap is actually showing the bottom. So you can see all the slits, right? Uh, so you put all these slits on a piece of paper. Then all the spores will drop down. So that's why you see this uh, very nice print here. So these are all the spores that drop down from these uh, slits, which are called gills. Okay, so that's how you get all the spores. And this process is called spore print. Now, what happens after the spores are released? So after the spores are released, they will germinate. You know, very much similar like seed germination. The root will come out and all that. So 
but fungus doesn't have uh, roots, right? What they have are these strands of that, what look like a uh, cotton wool kind of thing. So then under the microscope, you can see all these strands, right? Now, if you are looking in the forest or on the ground where there are hyphae growing, then you can see this white stuff growing on the leaf, right? So these spread out. It's actually a very nice pattern. Uh, they spread out onto the dead leaf and then they start growing. So all these are called mycelium, basically a clusters of fungal hyphae. Okay, fungal hyphae, uh, the, the plural is H-Y-P-H-A-E, right? Hypha is singular. Then mycelium is a cluster of all these hyphae, okay? So one cluster is one mycelium. Many, many clusters will be mycelia, okay? Right, so in the forest, uh, then uh, the, 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 the fungus, will spread, the hyphae will spread, the mycelium will spread. Now, when they reach uh, another, so let's say one mycelium meet another mycelium, you know, Harry meets Sally, then they will undergo sexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction, then they will produce mushrooms. So here you can see uh, like what look like a fairy ring of mushrooms. Basically, they are eating their way out. So as they grow, they feed, and then they'll produce the mushrooms. So it looks like a ring as they feed outwards. So this is like NPARCs put, uh, putting a lot of the mulch in the center. Uh, so as they feed, they use up, right? So they grow outwards. Then the next um, group of fungi that utilize some other materials will start to grow as well. So you can see near the tree trunk, there are other uh, fungi starting to grow. So they will also feed outwards, okay? Now, if you were to try to grow a uh, fungus right, uh, in the lab, so this is a Petri dish with um, a, uh, potato dextrose agar. It's, it's some kind of you know, potato, then they, they grind it out, and then that's the, the nutrient source that the fungus use. So it, it's all liquid mixed together with agar. So when you put a little bit of the fungus in the center, then they'll utilize this, this food source and grow outwards. So as they grow outwards, they feed on the nutrient. So you can see that's why they are growing outwards. So this is how we, we grow mycelium in the lab. Now, um, for fungi, right, when we look at them, uh, they are actually having their own kingdom. So you have kingdom, the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom. They also have fungi kingdom. It's their own kingdom because they are completely different from uh, plants, from animals. And there is a lot of them, extremely diverse. How diverse is millions of species. And this is just based on what uh, the current technology uh, can determine and estimate. Okay, this is all estimation. It could be more, right? Definitely could be much more than this number. And this is uh, studied by Kevin Hyde in 2022. Now, most of them haven't been identified because for the longest time, you know, in most textbooks, uh, fungi is just a, a decomposer, right? Uh, then after that, people forget about them. Uh, then if they get mold, then they say, what is that, you know? So a lot of the, the fungi has, has been ignored, has been not, hasn't been studied by even most universities. So that's why we don't really know much of a lot of things. Mm -hmm. But what we know today is, is already better than in the past, huh? Um, in terms of the organisms, uh, mm -hmm. they can come in the form of one cell, meaning unicellular or multiple cells. So mushroom that you're familiar with will be multicellular. Uh, the yeast that you may have used to bake bread before, there will be one cell, one organism. So bear with me. Huh? Now, there's, there's a lot of them, right? A lot of fungi. So uh, I will just give you some idea of what they are, right? And based on this, um, uh, you know, in, in, in biology, we, we classify organisms. Huh? So imagine you have, the, the kingdom would be referring to like a, a house, right? A house with many rooms, right? And then uh, in each room, you put 
Okay, this one is a bedroom. This one is a, a study. This one is a, a, a another room for the for the, the 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 male children. Another room for the female children. So kingdom is like a house, right? Then we put them into separate uh, rooms. Then there will be like phylum, right? You you separate the all the the units, uh, Okay, uh, then the rest we we ignore for the moment. Uh, then genus and species is like identifying the organism specifically. So like for us humans, right, we are Homo sapiens. Uh, okay, Homo is the genus and then sapiens is the species. Now, there are a few uh, phylum. Uh, when phylum in plural form is phyla. Okay, so this um, classification is based on 2019 paper, but it has been more changes since then, uh, but just for the sake of this presentation, I just limit to a few phyla that we can sort of understand. Okay, so the first one is the, uh, you know, Kitritio mycota. So mycota, when you see the, the mycota word ending, right, is referring to the phylum. La. So for all these scientific terms, got different, different word endings. So that's why we have this thing. Okay, uh, so the chytridio mycota basically in short form are chytrids, right? Uh, so they are all microscopic. You don't know that they exist because all microscopic unless you go and look for them. Um, now what is so special about this is that the chytrids, right? Um, they can uh, swim. Okay, their spores can swim. Okay, and what's more, uh, from what we know, uh. The, they are parasites, you know, planktons, right? Planktons are uh, other groups of organisms in the, in the aquatic environment. So the marine planktons will be those uh, that are in the water. Uh, <clears throat> so they, these chytrids will actually act as parasites of the marine plankton, you know, those that photosynthesize uh, for phytoplankton. Right, so they 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 uh you know latch on to this um phytoplankton, and then they eventually kill them uh. but <clears throat> in so doing right, they help to uh create nutrient flow because these uh phytoplankton they die, then they allow the nutrients to be released. Okay, so although they may be parasitic, they are also useful uh, in the in the whole picture. Now then, other chytrids, they cause what is called wart disease in potatoes. So you can see here this picture, right? Um, got healthy potatoes and those that have all these very deformed warts. So the chytrid fungus, um, the spores swim in the, the, in the soil, right? In the wet soil, and then they'll infect the potato. And then after they infect, they cause all this deformity. So by the time these form, right, you cannot eat radio really, and nobody on the cell so uh, okay, or buy. Now, another famous um problem that chytrids uh cause uh this particular genus and species, right? You can see it here. Uh short form we call it BD. Uh, they cause the death of a lot of amphibians worldwide. And it's a recent um phenomenon. Um, so what happens is you can see my mouse here. Uh, this small right is can swim on uh, with the flagellum here. They swim and then they go onto an amphibian. Then they start to you know latch onto it and then grow into the skin of the amphibian. Now in so doing, they uh cause the the amphibian to die. Okay. Now once the amphibian has all this infection. They the chytrid also reproduce and produce even more of these uh, swimming spores. So then there'll be more of these swimming spores around and you know infect other amphibians. Okay, so it's it's once there is this disease, then you just keep on spreading. Uh, of course, not every single amphibian species in the world get infected, um, but they they did cause uh, a lot of amphibians and some actually go extinct. So it's a big problem. Okay, then the next one, the next group is the second one. Uh. So it's Neocalimestigomycota. Okay, why do I want to mention them? Such a mouthful. Uh, because they are found in the digestive tract of 
all the herbivores are. Okay, those that have been studied are the cows, sheep, and horses, but there are others. Lah. It's just that it's it's not well studied. And of course, um, carnivores and even we also have this kind of fungi in our digestive tract. Now, what do they do? They help to break down cellulose and you know lignin and all the plant products. Uh, and because they are in the digestive tract, right? So they don't need oxygen. I mean, inside our gut, right? Far, far down the gut, there's no oxygen. So these uh, fungi can actually do very well without oxygen, okay? Now, the third one, third one is also another microscopic fungi. Um, they live in, you know, all the aquatic environment because again, they can swim. Um, what do they do? They also do the same, decompose plant and animal, and they also parasitize arthropods, right? All the insects and any organisms that have jointed legs. Uh. So, um, so if if there are a lot of these arthropods around, uh, they they act as population control, right? So these um, uh, smalls, right? Remember, they can all swim, uh. Uh, they will, so let's say, let's say uh, there is a, 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 an arthropod or something, uh, a dead thing, right? It's, it's dead already. Then it's starting to decompose with uh, using bacteria or whatever. Then uh, there'll be leachate, right, of protein. So, or the cells burst, then there'll be all this protein leach out. So these spores will, you know, swim towards this um, protein source. And then once it, at, finds the protein source, will attach, then penetrate, and then continue to grow and uh, feed. And then at the other end of whatever substrate that is, right, that dead body, right, then they also produce more hyphae and then continue to produce more spores. Okay, so all three of them actually were split from the chytrids, uh, from, you know, based on more understanding. So they split them into three different phyla. Now the fourth one, uh, this one is also you know split from something else, uh, so it's like somebody not happy in the room, then they move things around lah. So yeah, science science we do this a lot lah. So the mycota, um, the the very uh, common examples will be, uh, some of the bread mold, okay, the rhizopus, rhizopus or the mucor, so they belong to this phylum. Now, this morning when I was in lab seven, uh, if, for those of you who came from life science, uh, you will know that famous lab. Uh. Uh, so I saw two strawberries, uh, they were rotting away <laughs> there to a picture. So on a close-up, you can see all these, right? So they are either uh, muco or rhizopus. Uh. So they are all growing on the strawberry, or the strawberry can eat already. Now, they are not always, I mean, this group, uh, they are not always bad. Nah. You know, tempeh, uh, the, we eat tempeh, is actually made by another rhizopus. You see the different species name. So this is a good one, okay? Or at least good for us lah, in terms of food. The the bread mold and all that, um, they are actually just breaking things down. So it is is bad for us because the food spoil, but it's actually okay you know, in, in the whole picture, things break down and then the nutrients get released, okay? Yeah. Now, the fifth one, this one is the glomeromycota. Uh, these ones, you, again, you will never see them because they are all very small. Uh, they have, if you look at older literature, they are they have other names like vesicular, arbuscular, mycorrhizal fungi or VAM for short, or arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, or AMF, okay? Now, what's the big deal about these guys? They they have big spores, about 1 mm in diameter. Uh, 1 mm is the max, really. Uh. Usually, they are a bit smaller than this. So, they are in the soil, and once the plant, the, once there are plants around, right, with roots, then these spores will germinate, you know, like, like plant seed, germinate and then grow towards the roots. So they will penetrate into the roots. So they will penetrate into the root and you can see my mouse here. Uh, these are strands of these um, AMF uh, hyphae uh, going into the root. Now, what do they do for the plant? Now, over here, uh, you see the spore, okay, in this other picture on the left. 
So these spores are actually outside the root. They germinate and then the hyphae go into the root. Then, of course, not only do the hyphae go into the root, there are hyphae that grow into the uh, soil as well. In growing out, uh, they bring nutrients uh, to the plant root. So imagine uh, the plant root, right? Maybe the, at most they can read like uh, one meter, let's say. Uh, let's say. Uh, the root, this plant, the root length, the max is one meter. But because of all these high fee, right, it can reach further, right? So it can can go quite far, two, three, four, five, six meters to to draw in nutrients. So they act like biofertilizer, right? Better than plant roots because plant roots cannot extend so far. So it's very important for uh, plants. And a lot of the plants have this kind of AMF except brassica, lah, okay? Then how do they look like? The spores uh, look like this. Okay, some of them look like this. There are others. Then <clears throat> the sixth group, the sixth group is called Ascomycota. <clears throat> or they are called sac fungi. Like right? we got sac. And they are extremely biodiverse. Excuse me. Huh? <clears throat> So an example is this very cute name, peanut butter cup, right? So it's a cup, uh, then it's brown, so that's why it looks like peanut butter. Lah. Okay, then the scientific name is Trichelurina javanica, and they belong to this group, the sac fungus. Okay, so how does this, why do we call sac fungus? Okay, let me share again uh, an, an, a video. Okay, and then you understand what I mean. Okay, let me close this. Okay, so now you uh, you can see this. Okay, there are two uh, sac fungus mushroom, right? And then you see the smoke coming up. Okay, the smoke are the spores. So basically, you have this cup, right? The fungus, huh? the cup. And then there are uh, spores, sac at the bottom, the inner surface of the cup. And then they shoot out, right? Release all the spores, like smoke, all come out, you know, at regular intervals. So that's why they are called sac fungi, and they, uh, that's how they release their spores. Okay, yeah. So they they are very different in terms of biology. Okay, so let's continue. Now there are of course others right uh, others um you may have seen them before uh this is like dead man's fungus like uh, dead man's fing fingers sorry uh, so they 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 stick out from the ground so this one not so not so similar to a dead man's fingers but some of them really look like dead man's fingers coming out from the ground uh so they these guys um they have uh sexual as well as asexual reproduction but they all look the same externally and then lichens uh, are you all familiar with lichens lichens are these things that um in singapore we see this form very often uh there are other forms right you see this spreading growth on tree trunks and they are not part of the tree trunk so basically lichens are fungus a fungus partner plus either an algae or a blue-green algae. Blue-green algae is also called cyanobacteria. Actually, they are bacteria, right? Very ancient group, um, but they have the ability to photosynthesize, okay? Yeah. Um, so the, the, this group, uh, the also sac fungus. Sometimes they have other uh, associations as well, but we leave it as sac fungus for now. Lah. Then in terms of the mole, uh, they are also members of this sac fungus Ascomycota. Okay. Uh, sometimes you might get uh, nail or toenail or fingernail infections. How you know it start to become powdery. Uh, so those are the infected nails. Uh, so this is also sac fungus. Uh, your bread, you know, if you bake bread, you use yeast. Uh, then they are also members of this. Okay. 
they are very, very important because without yeast, your bread won't rise. Of course, chemically you can do that, but it's not the same taste, right? So these are unicellular fungi, okay? So one cell, one organism. They reproduce by budding. So like pimple are uh, growing all the face, then become bigger and bigger. Then eventually pop, then you get the next yeast. Uh, then, you know, moldy bread, a lot of them are also these sac fungi, but they could also be the mucoromycota, right? The, the, the fourth group that I mentioned earlier. Now we come to the seventh group, right? Uh, so they are the most uh, familiar to us, lah, as in mushroom that you can see with your eyes, you know, don't have to struggle with microscope. Like this one, this one, wine glass fungus. Very pretty, right? And then the puffball are very big ones. Okay, some of them are very big, like, you know, the, 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 like, like this big kind of thing. Uh, some of them are edible, right? Yeah. Then, of course, you have these ink cap mushroom. Uh, morning, you see them. By late morning, they are gone. Very fragile, very small, but very pretty. Okay. So, very often, you find them in mulch, uh. That means like in parks put you know this mulch for the plants to grow. Uh, if there is some uh plant matter, you will see them. And you can see some of these as well. Uh, in the ground, right? Uh, these ones are soft jelly like, very pretty as well. Uh, this one uh is called the stinghorn fungus or a uh, bridal veil. Like look like bridal veil, right? See this one. Uh, so um. It is sold, it is cultured in China commercially and is sold as Zhu Seng, right? Uh, so they remove the, the spore bearing part. Uh. Okay. Now this one I'm sure you are familiar with. If you love mushroom soup or stir fry mushroom, uh button mushroom. But then uh, button mushroom and portobello mushroom are actually the same thing. They are just different strain, uh, one allowed to grow big and to maturity. Uh. Ah, then you see this? This one is also a fungus. Where's the fungus? You ask. Okay, is this black stuff? Okay. And then it's called horsehair fungus. Okay. Crinis equi. Yeah. So, yeah. So this is the fungus. Um, bird's nest fungus, uh, they really look like cups with little um egg-like thing. Right, these gray stuff are the egg like thing. Each of these egg like thing have a lot of spores inside. So when water droplets drop down, uh this egg like thing will spill out. So when they spill out, they just spill out next to you know the original cup. That's why they are all growing in a cluster. Then you have these jelly fungus, right? Uh so when it rains, then you see them come out. Then if it hasn't rained for a few days, then you'll shrivel up. But it hasn't died because all the things that you don't see are in the wood. Next one is this one, right? Sclero means uh, heart, derma means skin. So basically, it is a very similar to the puffball, but this one has a stalk underneath. So when rain drops, the whole, right, uh, the spores will spill up. Okay. Yeah. So they are also called, I mean, earth balls, lah, common name. Then you have Earth Star. So these are again very, very small ones. And then they have uh let me share 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 a video and then you can see how they release the spores. Okay, let's close this. Okay, let me play this. Okay, let me speed up a bit. So you see the water droplet drop down, right? And then the spores shoot out. Okay, so that's how they um release the spores. Lah. Of course, if no rain, you go and you know pickle it, you can press on it, they will also release spores. Okay, so they you see the the cloud of dust means there are thousands of spores. So within each of these you know fruiting bodies, there'll be you know hundreds and thousands of spores. Lah. Okay, yep. Let's continue with more slides to show you. So that's Earth Star. Then, of course, you have these ones. Um, these ones are 
um, uh, the scientific name is Pycnoporus. So they are extremely orange in color. Okay, so uh, you can actually extract the color. So just now I show you a lot of examples already, right? So you can actually guess where you can find them. Uh. But let me give you more ideas. So obviously with all that spores, they are found in the air, right? Uh, there are also broken pieces of mycelia that are also in the air. Your air con filter, uh, if you don't clean, right, the, that filter looks black, right? It's not just dust, uh, it's also fungus, uh, okay? The spores and all the mold and all that. So do clean them regularly. This kind of thing cannot save one. Uh, then obviously a lot in the soil. Uh, desert also have, okay? Um, sometimes uh, the, they are actually buried below the surface of the sand, they are below. Uh, some others, you know, people say, uh, they, they think that maybe the manna mentioned in the Bible could also be fungus. Then anywhere with water, right? So freshwater, marine, hypersaline environment also have fungus. Then extreme alkaline or extreme acidic also have. Uh, where can you find this kind of situation is where, you know, those mines, mining ponds, there will be this kind of situation. Uh. Uh, sewage or polluted environment also have uh, food, of course, you know, fungus, uh, in fact, fungus contaminated food or fungus uh, derived food. Um, orchids cannot grow without fungus. Uh, ferns, all these also have. So basically, everything also have, right? And everything that has water will have. So specifically, uh, uh, if we talk about marine fungi, right, they are actually found either on or inside the marine organism. Uh, the marine organism can be anything from ranging from algae, coral, sponges, or even other fungi that's in floating in the water or in the organisms, or they could be in the mangroves themselves, mangrove plants, uh, inside the plants, right? Then um, if you look at other habitats in the marine environment, then there's the beach, right? Actually, beach also have because some of them come from the sea, right? The seawater. Some of them just choose to live there. Then uh, deep sea sediments also have water column, you know, throughout the whole water column of the sea from, from, from the shallow to all the way down to the deep also have. Um, in both of the uh, Arctic and Antarctic also have those wood they are drifting you know after a storm also have uh, all the marine plastic and garbage also have okay so yeah they are everywhere now in the freshwater environment also have okay let me show you uh, this very nice um, uh, the freshwater one okay so the freshwater fungi uh, just to show you pictures lah Okay, so they look like these. Uh, these are spores. Very, very pretty. Very, very strange looking. Almost like, you know, uh, things that like half completed uh, work of art kind of thing. Right, you see these? Yeah, so they are very, very strange looking. And they, um, they don't have sexual reproduction. So that's the spore you know, the spore will germinate to give you new individuals. So, yeah, not much is known, or at least I don't study them. Uh, there are some groups uh, of mycologists who study them. Um, yeah, then, then the other link, I forgot to get it. But people have actually found mushroom, uh, really, you know, the, the gill mushroom in, in some water bodies in the U.S. And they are found in the bottom of freshwater streams. So they are literally everywhere. Lor. Then, because they have all these spores, right? Remember I mentioned all the videos that you've seen, the spores will be in the air. So if they land on something that they like, then they will germinate. So like my pineapple tart, for instance, right? Or this one is um, uh, my, my class, uh, my class, uh, fungal bio class. So we get the students to, to put all these agar and then expose them to different locations. So this one is S1A rooftop, right? Uh, near the aircon vent. Also got different, different uh, colonies. Uh, of course, bread got different color one, means got different fungi. 
Oops, I think I forgot to share. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, okay, now you can see. Yeah, so I was talking about all these. Uh. So the spores land on any of these suitable substrate, then they will grow. Okay, then they will see different, different color. So once, okay, one, one word of warning is once you see mold, right, uh, please don't eat the food because then they will be producing um toxins. Uh, we can get quite sick. Uh. May not die, uh, you know, but again, depends on your immunity. So please don't eat anything that's moldy. Uh, and often you see this, right? Aircon environment, you know, the ceiling board get moldy. Uh, so please get it fixed. Okay. Um, glass lights. So my class now trying to, you know, look at plants. So a lot of the glass lights are moldy or not. <laughs> because yeah, they are just in the air. So if you don't touch them long enough, then the mold will grow. So if you just look at them under microscope, they're actually quite pretty. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then you have uh, this one is the fungus um, growing out of the asphalt. So they are actually very, very powerful because of turgor pressure, means water pressure, like, like balloon right, with a lot of pressure. When you put the balloon with a lot of water inside, you keep pumping, uh, then the balloon will burst. Uh. But in this case, uh, the fungus will not burst. Okay, So the fungus will actually break, force itself out of the asphalt. Then this one, uh, I, I got this sample from uh, Miss Teng Hua. She went to China to collect uh, all these spiders. When she first collected them, of course, they are alive. Huh? Then a few days later, uh, the, 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 the spider died. Right? So, um, yeah, I, I didn't study what they are, but most likely they are Escomycota. Now, the, the fungus uh, has been around for the longest time. And there's this fun fungus, which is a fossil. Um, they call it prototaxitis. So you can see there's this man and he's digging up the fungus. So you can see how big and how long it is. So it's huge. Huh? Um, for the longest time, people who study this, right, they didn't know what it was. And finally, uh, when they look under microscope after doing tin tin sections, then they realize that they are um, yeah, fungus. So why the title, why powerful, right? Uh, so fungi have the ability to break down, you know, all the dead stuff, lah, okay, which is just as well. Otherwise, all these dead stuff will be lying around. And also they can break down all the harmful stuff that we create, right? Uh, in so doing, they clean up the environment. So that's called microremediation. And also they have the ability to support many industries that uh, produce enzymes commercially, you know, enzymes that help to, you know, break down um, uh, uh, paper or, you know, food substances. Uh, so yeah, these are very, very important enzymes. And then uh, in terms of food production, all these, right? And then health-wise, they... Penicillin is the first antibiotics that we got from fungus, okay? And then organ transplant uh, requires lifelong consumption of cyclosporine. It's also from fungus, okay? So let me elaborate the rest. So um, when trees die, they, they fall over, uh, then the fungus will start to attack, right? And then in so doing, they release the nutrients for other organisms to feed on. So life continues, ah, right? And then, of course, they also decompose animals, including us. Then uh, they can also break down um, plastics, right? Uh, from the marine environment, uh, there have been studies of these two, the Nia and the Helosyphena. Then in the terrestrial environment, Aspergillus and this, this one, and this one, uh, Pestalotiopsis as well. Okay, so got, yeah or quite a few candidates. Uh, then, of course, there are also other things that we make, like chemicals, you know, pesticides, um, herbicides, fungicides. They can also be broken down. Okay? Some of these have even been patented, the, the technique. Um, you know, when we take 
uh, pharmaceutical drugs, they we we actually pass them out as well. So um, they can also be broken down by fungi. Synthetic dyes, you know, when we buy colored clothes, uh, many of them are made of synthetic dyes. Now they are actually quite toxic. Uh. So during the dyeing process, the excess are discharged into the environment. So it is just as well that there are fungi that can break this down. Now, this is very interesting. This one is um, a kind of truffle. They call it deer truffle, which we don't eat. Um, they are related to the truffle that we eat. And in Europe, they found that the wild boar also eat this. Wild boar love this. And they found out that they take in the radioactivity. And so because they are so radioactive, uh, the hunters don't hunt them anymore because they know cannot eat already. So uh, they found that this fungi can accumulate lead, cadmium, you know, heavy metals, and even the, the cesium-135 and cesium-137. So these are radioactive um, substances, and the fungus basically accumulate them. So then people wonder, is this from the, the, the Chernobyl nuclear plant explosion? But when, they, when the, the scientists look at it, they realize, no, this was from earlier nuclear testing that was done, you know, like the, in the 80s or even before. So these fungi have been accumulating all this radioactivity and then the, the wild boar going to eat them. And then, yeah, so they are, they are around. Okay. Um, then, of course, just now I mentioned all these enzymes, right? So these enzymes can also be from many of these, uh, uh, you know, uh, fungi. Law. Okay. Uh, then when we produce food, when you want to, you know, make the tea, you know, the tea leaves, the coffee, the chocolate, all have to be fermented initially before you roast them or you, you do whatever process. The fermentation is done by natural fungi in the environment. Uh, make specialized cheese, of course, you need specialized fungi. Uh, miso is also, you know, done through all these, you know, in the list are also uh, carried out by fungi at different, different stage. Salami, right, the white stuff outside is also fungus. Your morel mushroom, the whole thing can eat also fungus. Um, then people have tried to use uh, fungus and they have made uh, mushroom break uh, because making break is actually quite um, damaging uh, to the environment. So they try to substitute. So uh, mushroom break is one. Then there are others, uh, you know, using um, waste product. Then you grow the mushroom. Then you see they can try to do this kind of thing, uh, right? So yeah, the whole building made of uh, fungus bricks, okay? Yeah, so that's how uh, this can potentially be done. Uh, in Singapore, we have to do more studies because uh, it's too humid, um, then the fungus will break down, okay? Yeah, then of course, uh, there, you know, earlier you saw that slide where the spider got infected, right? So insects uh, also get infected by fungi. So the buvaria is a is a very well studied one, and um, the commercial sector get the spores and then uh, sell it to people who need to kill insects, right? Especially when the insects are pests, and then they they um, apply these spores, and then these spores will germinate in the insect, kill the insect, and then because they grow, right, then they'll produce more spores. So it's a continuous process. You buy one time, wah, then continue already. Then there are other, other types of organisms which also do the same as pesticides. So there are others, lah, okay, also under the ESCO mycota. Now, um, in terms of, um, uh, you know, people try to do reforestation, right? So they grow uh, all these plants. Then, uh, but you can't harvest them until like several decades later. So what do the, the, the farmers do, right? So this Dr. Chachai, uh, my mycologist friend, he introduced this fungus, Astrius, to the roots of these diptorocarps, right? And then these estrus will regularly produce the mushrooms and then the farmers can harvest this and sell and make a living while the tree continue to grow. 
So it's a win-win now, -win, right? For the environment, for the tree, for reforestation, and for the farmer as well. Um, we in Singapore, we have uh, edible uh, mycorrhizal fungi as well. So like this one, for instance, uh, Amanita malayensis is actually associated with uh, one of the diptrocarps, which is not native. And then, um, yeah, I ever see people harvest it. Lah. Um, probably they are Thai people. Yeah. Uh, then the remember the glomeromycota that I mentioned earlier, um, they help to uh, bring the nutrients to the plants. Uh, in they also help the plant in coping with, let's say salt sea water, uh, you know sea sea level rise right, a lot of salt. Uh, you know now now irregular irregular rainfall pattern also drought. Then heavy metals or extreme temperature. So having these guys around are very very useful. And that very important is when the plant store carbon, right? The soil with the fungi also store carbon. So there's there's a lot of carbon being stored by fungi in the soil, and they have huge biomass. And furthermore, the fungi, uh, the AMF, uh, produce this substance called glomelin, and this substance binds soil particles together. So it helps to reduce erosion. Uh. Now, if you see fungi around, don't go and collect, okay? Please don't go and eat wild mushroom, especially if you are not sure. Uh, even sometimes mycologists can get it wrong. Some of them can be very toxic, right? Or some of them, they, you know, like sequester heavy metals or radioactive. Good thing SFA test for this. Uh. So, yeah, please don't go and anyhow eat. Um. In in the condition right now, there are very few antifungal drugs. Ah. You know, basically it's quite hard to develop. And furthermore, it's not as um lucrative. So uh yeah, with fungi, you know, liking warmth, uh, you know, with a lot of humidity, there will be more fungal infection. Ah. So this has already been documented. Um, this disease called mucomycosis. So during the COVID period, a lot of the, uh, you know, um, uh, people who caught COVID, um, they they their health maybe not as good to begin with, uh, maybe they are already diabetic. So when they uh were given some medicine to suppress their immunity, the mole right, the black mole, which are the mucomycota. Um, the spores they breathe in, and then they the the spores germinated and then grow in the sinus and into even the brain. So some of these people die lah. Okay, and in in trying to save them, they have to carry out operations. So it's very uh, very very terrible, and even mycologists can get sick. Okay, because uh this particular example, uh this mycologist who works with uh sick plants, silver leaf disease. Um, he regularly deal with the fungus and he got infected as well. So a plant fungus jump holes to a human, right? So, uh, you know, fungi can give us a lot of surprises. One. But the good news is this guy lived, okay? After after being treated with uh, two dose, two rounds of antifungal drugs. So today you learn some things about fungi. Uh, there are a lot of things we don't know. Uh, we hope to have more people interested and more studies because we really need to know how to store more carbon and how to use fungi to conserve biodiversity, to help forests to be restored, and how to deal with fungal diseases. Right. So if you want to learn more, uh, if you want to just learn the forms and where to find them, you can join the Facebook group Mushroom Spotter Singapore. Or if you're an undergrad, you can take my course, 3259. Or if you're interested in the medical mycology side, you can take this 3266. That's 3226. Or if you want to buy the book, uh, you can buy this book at Singapore Botanic Gardens at $26. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank Hope you enjoyed the talk. Thank you, Dr. Chu. It was very, very interesting. Thank you for generously sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, yeah, so I think we have a couple of questions from the Q&A box. Uh, some people have been discussing quite a bit in the chat box also. Maybe I'll address the questions. We'll, uh, I'll get you to address the questions in the Q&A um, 
recap first. Uh, one person asked whether it's possible to live for the size, I guess, freeze dry fungi. Uh, yes, you can freeze dry fungi. Yeah, especially some, some commercial mushroom, they actually freeze dry or uh, freeze dry or they even um, uh, freeze dry and fry. Yeah, but that's for eating. Uh. Yeah, but if uh, uh, if you want to freeze dry for studies, uh, um, they may not be alive anymore. Yeah, but it really depends. Yeah, sometimes fungi got surprises, but usually it's not for is is not so much for, uh, yeah, it's more for eating and more for, yeah, studying the forms uh, to preserve them but not to revive them, yeah. Uh, there's another question on whether fungi can kill birds. Uh, yeah, can yes, can. Um, especially if the, um, the spores go into their, their, their lungs and all that. And if they are weakened, they can be killed. Mm. In fact, fungi can kill anything. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, mm. the black spots in vegetable chopping boards. Uh, uh yeah, they are fungi. Yes. And someone has asked whether anyone has started using fungi to break down plastics commercially. Um, I'm not sure whether it has been done commercially, but they have. There have been studies. There have been quite a number of studies. Uh, but the trouble is, this kind of studies, um, uh, they they haven't tried it out in the wider environment. Yeah. But there are there are studies. Okay. Uh, this question is from Priscilla. As an educator and a researcher, what kind of myths and misinformation have you had to address in recent years? Uh, where's the question? Oh, Not at the bottom. Yeah, uh, mm. I mean, there are is is there are a lot of um claims uh, by fungi. I mean, people who, who uh, say fungi can do all sorts of things. Uh, but, you know, then you check other literature or there's no literature, uh, there's no studies, no data. Yeah, then, you know, then, then, then have to, have to, have to always have evidence uh, or repeat the experiment. So it's the same with any fields of science. It's not only mycology. Mm. Mm. And maybe one last question before we end off today's um, talk. William asks, uh, what is the difference between acidic mushroom and alkaline mushroom? Is it the medium that they are grown in? Uh, so for the fungi that prefer acidic environment, so these are extreme environments. Uh, that means like mining ponds where they use extreme acids or alkali to take the desired mineral out of the soil. Um, fungi have been found in these extreme environments. Um, so those that prefer acid will be found in acidic environment. Those that prefer alkaline will be found in alkaline environment. Uh, and they have the ability to cope with that kind of extreme pH. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, um, there's a couple of questions that I think we will not be able to answer because it's almost nine o'clock. So maybe um if you have if you do have any questions, you can send it to uh the email address of our outreach and education unit. I will compile the questions and then I will get Dr. Chu to answer them. And then maybe maybe we will update our website with the answers. Yeah, so with that, maybe just let me share my screen for a final few slides. So um, 
So that once again, thank you, Dr. Chu, for generously sharing your knowledge on fungi and their uh, applications to humans. So I would like to invite everyone to maybe uh, scan the QR code on the left for the feedback form. And there will be a question on um, our giveaway contest. If you would like to enter our giveaway contest to um, send a chance to win our set of postcards, then you can enter your email address. Uh, I will also send uh, put in the feedback form link in the chat box yeah and also dr chung will be having another talk this time it's not on fungi it's uh, on plants perception of plants and why they matter and if you are interested i will also put down the link in the chat box this talk will happen next tuesday and it's a uh, uh, it's hosted by National Library Board in partnership with the NUS Department of Biological Sciences. So give me a moment. Okay. So maybe while you are filling up the form, here is actually the link to sign up for Dr. Chun's talk next Tuesday. Yes. And, <laughs> <laughs> yes, and also um, Dr. Chung also mentioned about the book that she has recently co-authored. You can actually find the book uh, in the National Libraries as well. I just borrowed one copy from Amokyo Library. <laughs> yeah, so you can check it out if you are not making a trip down to Singapore Botanic Gardens, you can borrow it from the library. Uh, one last uh, talk that I would, I would like to advertise for. Uh, next up on our LKC and HN Talk Shop series, we are actually having another talk two weeks later, exactly um, on a Thursday at 8pm again. This time, um, our deputy head of the museum is speaking about um, exploring and describing all of biodiversity in the world, especially in the marine environment. So if you are interested, I will put in the link in the chat box as well. On a moment. And there you go. Yep, so with that, uh, I wish everyone a restful night and thank you, Dr. Cho, again uh, for the wonderful hey. talk.